Well, El Salvador now uses Bitcoin as reserve currency. So who will be next and what does this mean for crypto markets? Jeremy Britton is here for more. Jeremy, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me on the show. Good to see you. Jeremy, why is El Salvador using Bitcoin as a reserve currency? There's a lot of emerging economies who have really done poorly um, through market manipulation, currency manipulation through the IMF and the USA and, and other places. Uh, particularly the emerging nations and the, the third world countries have suffered. Senegal and there's five other countries in Africa who had their currency devalued between 2% and 50% in a single year. So obviously it makes sense for them to have something that is a bit more stable. The other thing with El Salvador is it's a, it's a poorer country and around about a third to two thirds of the money that they actually receive in the country is from expats who are actually sending money back home to friends and family. Now, the people who live in the first world are sending back money to El Salvador can pay between 10 and 12 percent as a fee to send money into El Salvador, whereas with Bitcoin, it's like a thousandth of a percent. So it's significantly cheaper and will take away a lot of business from Wirex and Western Union and bank transfers. Yeah, El Salvador are definitely leading the way here, aren't they? Which countries do you think may follow suit with El Salvador? Uh, I think a lot of the, the African and Latin American countries where there's significant portions of unbanked people, some of these countries have got 30 to 40 percent of people who have never had a bank account and mostly been dealing with cash. Um, there's also countries such as Cuba, which Cuba has been, because of their, their little sort of Cold War with the US, they've been locked out of the SWIFT system. You can't use MasterCard, you can't use Visa card in Cuba. So we're, we're banking that it's, it's going to be um, Laos next, which has just decriminalised Bitcoin, Cuba, Mexico, Paraguay, possibly Brazil and Iran will follow suit. And after a while, it'll become all the other countries don't want to be last. No one wanted to be first into Bitcoin because it was seen as scary and volatile. But once you see you know, billionaires moving in there and entire countries moving into there, no one's going to be, want to be last to jump on that train. Yeah, we're seeing all those countries. The only major one that's probably a bit hesitant we're seeing potentially might be China. We know that there's been a lot of regulations from China as well. Do you support national currencies uh, backed by Bitcoin instead of gold? Uh, yes, I think Bitcoin's got a lot of advantages over gold. Um, gold has kept its value by and large for over 10,000 years. And in the years when our currencies were backed by gold and silver, we saw very, very few financial crises. When we went off the gold standard uh, between 1945 and 1971, there was a significant uplift in financial crises in, in different countries. Um, however, you know, there's, there's still gold mining going on. There's still people digging up gold. So every year, two or 3% more gold is added to the supply. So gold is a little bit inflationary. It can't be manipulated like currencies, which can just be printed willy-nilly by the, by the central banks. But Bitcoin is fixed. You can't get any more than 20 million. There's, there's no more to be had. So gold has got an inflation rate of around about 2 to 3%. Some currencies have an inflation rate of 15 to 100%, whereas Bitcoin has an inflation rate that is fixed at 0%. It's also significantly cheaper to transfer because if you had gold and you wanted to send me an ounce of gold, you're going to need an armor guard van and a guy to drive it and a guy with a gun to protect mm -hmm. it. But with Bitcoin, you can simply transfer it from one person's phone or via email instantly, and it doesn't need any assistance to get across the border. Yeah, that's a really good point that you make there. And I feel like everyone's just a little bit cautious about it at the moment. But as we see big companies begin to speak about it, we know a lot of uh, buy now, pay laters are starting to talk about it as well. Uh, the more that big companies begin to accept it, I think it's creating more confidence in the cryptocurrency. What would be your advice mm -hmm. for, say, ordinary people wanting to get involved in the cryptocurrency sector at the moment? Well, it's still a very new sector and there's a lot to learn. You know, cryptocurrency has only been around for 10 or 12 years, whereas obviously stocks and gold and property have been around for hundreds if not thousands of years. Um, so people want to, want to avoid the scams, obviously. There's a lot of ways that you can go and go onto government sites and look at things. If it, it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. If someone's promising 1% per day, that's definitely a scam because within compound interest, 1% a day, you'd have over a trillion dollars by the end of the year. Um, we actually run a not-for-profit site called Krillionaire.com where we actually teach people a simple four-step protocol to avoid all the scams and to make sure they're investing into the good cryptocurrencies. I've been financial planning for 30 years and I use a methodology to choose the best stocks, the ones that are going to do well over the long term. And we've simply simplified that down to four steps 
for choosing the best cryptocurrencies. So you might not make a million percent in a year, um, but you can be sure that you're going to miss out on the scams and you'll get a good project that's going to be around for the longer term. Oh, remarkable stuff. Jeremy, great to chat with you about this. It's such an interesting topic that is changing and evolving every single day. Thanks for your time. Thank you. For more breaking news, jump on our website, tickernews.co. Let's check in on the weather. Hello, I'm William Howard with Ticker Weather. We begin in America today and following the destruction caused by Hurricane Nicholas, the US coast has largely been spared from storms this week, despite